Welcome to another edition of our Nocturnal Novellas. Yes, our November edition. So our ninth episode. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It is. <laughs> I can't believe that. I know we say this every month, but it's like nine months. This has really been happening. Yeah. In three <laughs> months, we'll have been doing this a year. Oh my goodness. I know. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> it is. So, how have you been? I know we are only doing these once a month episodes until January. So, yeah. how have you been? How's the new job? So, my new job is really cool. Um, It's a trades job, which I have, like, minimal experience <laughs> in. So, it's a lot of work right now, and I'm working some pretty crazy hours. But it's really cool. I work with a whole bunch of people, and a bunch of them have actually started listening because, you know, how they always do, like, so what, what do you do? What's your hobbies? So it's my fun fact is I have a podcast, and now a bunch of people from there listen. That is amazing. I know we got a new supervisor at work, and um, she actually... She's like, what's your podcast about? And she's like, I'm going to listen. <laughs> and I've had to forewarn her about the couple of episodes yep. where um, the dogs are included. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's that's great. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad they're listening. Yeah. And you're liking it. I seen that you got yeah. your first pair of coveralls. I did get my first pair of coveralls. I'm thrilled because for the first month, um, I was working under my co-worker's coveralls because she was the closest size to me but yeah no you got of, your own i got my own now they've got my name on them that's amazing i'm so happy for you uh-huh it's been cool it's been really cool that's awesome all right so let's jump right in do you want to go first do you want me to go first you can go first if you want okay she a hefty story okay all right so it is time for festivities and Christmas traditions. So today I'm going to cover a couple of holiday legends. Okay. Yes. Now I did save a couple of the really gooder ones for, for next month. Okay. Obviously. Good stuff. Good. But these ones are pretty fucking sweet. Okay. All right. Sweet. So Christmas, a time for bright lights, warm hearts, presents, families, and delicious foods. And Tara. Of course. <laughs> I mean, family. It is our podcast. <laughs> oh, no truer words have ever been spoken. So, perhaps not around most of the world, but Iceland is not like most of the world. Most of the world does not have Gryla and the Yule Lads. Okay. Sometimes referred to as the Christmas Trolls. And I got this story from GuideToIceland.com. Sweet. Yes. So now, terror is a slight exaggeration. But the concept of Santa in Iceland, in terms of Icelandic folklore, is different to the one we know in most of Western society. Mm -hmm. Rather than imagining a jolly fat man in red and white, the Santa of Iceland is 13 filthy trolls led by their mother, a child-eating giantess named Gryla. I love that. Okay. Have you ever heard of Gryla? No, I don't think I have. Okay, so if you ever watched Sabrina on Netflix. No. Okay. No, I haven't gotten around to that one yet. They do portray Gryla. Um, but it's not as wild as the story <laughs> truly is. All right. So, throughout the majority of the year, these twisted Yule lads are thought to, by many, to hide in daunting lava fortresses of Dimorborger, located in the Myvatin area of northern Iceland. Others believe they simply live in an unidentified mountain area. From the 11th of December to the 24th, however, they depart one by one to engage in the 13 Days of Mischief. Okay. <laughs> okay. Each has different antics, ranging from mischievous to horrifying, which they indulge in across the country until the end of the Christmas season. I love that spectrum. <laughs> Mischief to terrifying and everything in between. Right. Just, okay. Uh, and there's 13. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 13 days of Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Yule Lads are as much... A part of the country's festive traditions as Icelandic Christmas book flood and eating smoked lamb. Okay. Yeah. Today, their image has been tamed down, 
Rather than being depicted as trolls defined by extreme deformities, they now often wear the traditional red and white clothes, fluffy beards, and wide smiles. Because we need to westernize everything, I guess. Well, yeah. Rather than pulling pranks, they simply leave presents in the shoes that children place on their windowsills. A bit like the stockings on a fireplace. A little bit. In place of a piece of coal, naughty Icelandic children will simply find a potato in their shoe. <laughs> a potato. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You know what? I feel like it has multi-uses, unlike coal. You know, well, I mean, I don't know if you've ever smelt a bad potato. <laughs> I have. Yes, that is a memorable scent, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm liking to think that, like, they're not going to put a bad potato. I mean, you're naughty. Why would you get a good potato? A good potato is a great and beautiful thing. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so even though they've undergone somewhat of a transformation since the 19th century, the Yule Lad's original looks and behavior tell a wealth of information about Icelandic history, culture, and folklore. They are a great example of how festive traditions differ around the world. Mm -hmm. Which I could get behind that. Mm -hmm. The Yule lads may have become more friendly throughout the years, but their mother, Gryla, is still a frightening troll and remains one of the longest standing Christmas traditions in Iceland. Wow. This giantess is one of the evilest figures of Icelandic folklore, and horror stories about her are still told to children over the festive season. Mm hmm. Throughout the year, it is said that she collects whispers about children around the island misbehaving. And when winter sets in, she sets out to gather them. Her appetite for the flesh of naughty youths is insatiable, and each year she finds no shortage of her favorite crop. <laughs> Collecting them up in a sack, she then cooks them in a pot and turns them into a giant stew that will sustain her until the next winter. Oh my god. Th that is like a huge cauldron, if you think about it. If it's gonna last an entire year, like. Considering that she's a giant, yeah. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> These kids better be on their best behavior. Yeah. So, Gryla would be terrible enough if she worked alone. But sadly for the Icelandic children, she does not. She shares her mountain cave in northern Iceland with an enormous black feline cat called the Christmas Cat, which also has an appetite for human flesh. Okay, but it's a Christmas cat! Yeah. And it's a black cat! <laughs> the Christmas Cat, however, does not seek out those who have misbehaved. It happily eats any child that did not get new clothes to wear for Christmas. See? There you go. Just get me new clothes. I don't know. The tradition surrounding Gryla says a lot about Icelandic folklore. The fact that she was a child eater who sought out children over the festive season sends a similar message to kids as Santa bringing coal, just with a little less finesse. I would say. The message to children is loud and clear. Be on your best behavior during Christmas. <laughs> but, like, Gryla listens to whispers all year round. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not just over Christmas. No. The more brutal delivery of this message is perhaps due to the fact that winters in Iceland were incredibly dangerous and many disobedient children who went out into the dark and snow never returned home. Mm. There were also a lot there was also a lot of work that needed to get done before the darkest months set in, requiring extra diligence and effort from all members of the family. Yes. And if you're not pulling your weight, mm. Sir, you can be eating them. Yeah, yeah. You go to Gryla. Yeah. On this note, the story that the Christmas cat ate children who did not get clothes as a gift was likely created to ensure everyone finished their weaving, knitting, and sewing by the dead of winter. <laughs> so there is so much more to this folklore. So all thirteen trolls have their own names and they have their own mischief. That they cause. Yeah. I'm hoping that next year we'll run into season three during Christmas time. Yeah. And I will be able to cover all 13 of these trolls and go into deeper on Gryla and her husband 
and it is such a cool story. Awesome. Um, but yeah. I'm so excited to hear. Yeah, it, it is so cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a story, story of Gryla and the Yule Lads. Awesome. Okay, so I am not in a Christmas frame of mind at all. I am opposite. I feel the cold, and my first thought is, like, tropical destinations. Girl, <laughs> it is festive season. Mm, no. <laughs> all right, hit me with it. I'm going to add a new topic to my rotation, Beautiful. which is deadly locations. Okay. Is it going to be my parking lot at work? Uh, Because well, that is a deadly location. Okay, there's so many parking lots in Edmonton that you could just die <laughs> by looking at them. <laughs> Yeah, you look at them sideways, and there's probably half an inch of ice on there. Yeah, or the just the potholes alone <laughs> just take you out. If you're not busting an ankle, you're breaking a neck. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it, we're going to somewhere further off. Okay. We are going to be visiting the Blue Hole, a diving location on the coast of the Red Sea north of Dahab, Egypt. Okay. I've also heard that Egypt is not a great place for women heard that as well yeah but we're gonna focus specifically on the (laughs) blue hole okay 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 so the blue hole is known as a hot spot for extreme divers that want to try to get through the arch okay okay so there's gonna be photos on the insta right of course yeah so first discovered in 1968 the arch is a 26 meter tunnel that connects the blue hole to the open waters so this, you know, when you see pictures of the ocean and there's like a giant deep blue hole that's right all connecting to it. And there's like a little tiny section of land that, so that's what this is. Okay. Okay. So. It's like the, a portal into nothing. Pretty much. Beautiful. That's what it looks like. It's gorgeous. I'd love to go there. Okay. So. This stretch has cleaned the lives of so many divers that it is. It has also been called the Diver Cemetery. Mm -hmm. The opening to the arch is located 56 meters down, which requires more specialized equipment and training as the maximum depth for recreational divers is only 40 meters. You know, I don't enjoy water at the best of times, like open water. It's not my thing. But, mm mm-mm. Mm-mm. You don't want to dive 40 meters down? Absolutely. I probably wouldn't even dive five meters down. <laughs> There's far too many things in open bodies of water that can kill you. Why are you tempting fate with it? Because it's cool. There's a million ways to die above the water. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Okay. I think it's cool. <laughs> you know what? I will cheer you on. Good. So, even with these numbers, there are many who believe that they can take on the challenge. However, there is many fatal consequences. Not me. I know better. (laughs) See, I know, like, I love, I would love to learn how to scuba dive, but I also wouldn't rush into things. Like, I'm not so overconfident in my abilities. Like, this one, there's no way in hell I would try it. Yeah. Right? Right. Not without, like, 20 years of experience kind of thing. Or, like, if I had a guide with me or something like that, then okay. Yeah. But uh, solo, no way. Mm -mm. Okay. So the main challenge of completing the arch is gas management. Due to the clear waters, the tunnel looks much shorter than it is, and some divers are tempted to only bring one gas tank, which, although it has been done a few times, it's really not recommended. The entrance to the arch is also not easy to spot, so divers have been known to continue downwards, searching for the opening. Oh. Which is even more horrifying to me. Could you imagine that feeling of like, okay, where's where's this hole? I can't see. Like, it's, you're getting further and further down. Huh. Yeah. The blue hole is around 120 meters deep, and because the bottom is so deep, there's no visual depth reference. <laughs> Other considerations are the current that flows inward through the arch, adding time to pass through, and the depth and time requires decompression to stop decompression sickness. Mm -hmm. This added time underwater makes gas management vital for survival. 
Mm -hmm. So while the exact number of deaths at the Blue Hole are not reported, estimates are that between 130 to 200 people have died in a 15-year period. So Mm -hmm. it's it's more than enough people that you should be cautious. Yeah, I do. Yeah. One well-documented death is that of Yuri Lipsky, a 22-year-old Russian diver who dived to the blue hole on a single tank. Lipsky filmed his descent, which was record, which was recovered, making one of the best recorded scuba deaths. Which, like, you can, it's actually on YouTube. I looked it up, and oh I didn't get through the entire thing. But yeah, you can. The footage is out there. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. So the video showed the divers at an uncontrolled descent, and he reached the bottom floor, which was at approximately 115 meters. Holy shit. Lipsky started panicking, removing, he removed his regulator and tried to fill his buoyancy compressor, but he failed to rise. Oh, wow. At depths that deep, it is likely that Yuri Lipsky would have been subject to nitrogen narcosis, which can impair judgment, induce hallucinations, and cause panic and confusion. Lipsky's body was recovered the following day, so despite many risks associated with the blue hole, it is still a diving hotspot that is visited daily by divers. Wow. Right? That's crazy. What is your next novella? I'm sorry, I'm just taking in the fact that people have like the ability to do that <laughs> i know good god i'm really excited for my um scary destination my dangerous destinations i'm not i am i i, I love traveling and like i feel like i'm gonna have nightmares about this i mean i honestly it's a water thing it is truly like an open water ocean thing. Well, at least it's not in the open ocean. It's in the hole beside the ocean. It does not matter. <laughs> it's an abyss. It, it is an abyss. I, I'm yeah. going to have nightmares about this fucking hole. <laughs> and this wasn't even a full-blown story. This was a nocturnal novella. At least you done fucked me. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry, let me just collect myself. Okay. All right. So <laughs> my next story is one of the most well-known Welsh customs, and it is the Mary Laud, meaning Grey Mare. Okay. <clears throat> it is a, a horse figure carried from door to door by wassail singing groups during the Christmas season. Information from the Wales Museum website. Mm-hmm. Popular in southern Wales during the 19th century, the tradition features a real horse's skull, usually decorated with colored ribbons and rosettes, with glass bottle eyes. The lower jaw is fixed on a spring, which shuts the mouth with a loud snap and brings the creation to life. Yes. A long white cloth is draped down the carrier, which hides him from others' view. I love this so much. Occasionally, the head was of wool, of wood, not wool. One account says paper, and in around 1935, a group of boys in Swansea used a pillow, but a horse's head was characterized. Okay. The same horse's head tended to be used annually. For it was buried in lime to preserve it for the next year and dug up each December. Okay. Which, like... Okay, I don't really know, but I couldn't imagine digging something up in December in Canada. God, no, not in Canada. So I wonder if maybe the Welsh winters aren't nearly as harsh, but, like, I don't even think I'd be able to pierce the ground, let alone... Unless maybe they, like, bury it in, like, a cellar. That would make more sense. I I really hope, just for the sake of their backs, that it's buried inside somewhere. Yeah. Okay. I also wonder how easily accessible lime is. I think it's easier to... Like, I think you can get it at garden stores, can't you? Let's be honest here. You and I are both flagged at this point. I don't think we could. But... (laughs) 
I mean, yes. maybe. I don't know. I actually have no idea where you go to purchase them. I, I guess I'm going to have to, yeah. Let's Google it. Okay. I mean, it, just kidding. I was going to say, everybody should know where to get Lime, but no. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> You can get it at Lowe's. See, okay, yeah, a garden store. That's what I was thinking. Yep. Okay. So, good to know. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So, in terms of the celebration itself, the custom used to begin at dusk and often lasted late into the night. During the ceremony, a party of usually all men would carry the Mary through the streets of the village singing and dancing. Nice. The Mary does not hunt alone, for depending on the area and the amount of people in the wassailing party, she can be joined by an array of other characters named Punch and Judy, the Sergeant and Mary Men. Okay. Even very small groups usually have a leader who holds the reins to control the horse and take the charge of singing. They would visit every house or pub in the village and stand in front of the door to sing traditional songs. Next followed the Quinco, an improvised rhyme and verse contest between the Mari party and the inhabitants of the house. <laughs> there was a lot of leg pulling and the verses were usually quite mischievous. Traditionally, these exchanges would be done with the door closed and the contest could last for some time, sometimes even an hour or longer, until one side gave up. <laughs> if the Mari side lost the contest, they would have to leave without being admitted to the house. However, this would have been quite a rare occurrence, as the Mary entering the building was thought to bring good luck, so they would usually win or be allowed to win. Alternatively, the merry party might sing one last verse begging for entrance. Once inside, the entertainment continued with the Mari running around, neighing and snapping its jaws, <laughs> creating havoc and frightening the children, <laughs> while the leader pretended to restrain it. The merry men played music and entertained the households. Punch and Joy would also be part of the festivities. The participants would usually be rewarded with food and drinks, sometimes receiving a gift of money as well, and the visit concluded with a traditional farewell song. So a lot of the drinks usually included alcohol. Oh, yes. You mean somebody running around snapping a horse covered in a sheet wouldn't be getting alcohol? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so with the earliest account of the Mary dating from 1798, the boom years, as regards to the amount of horses' heads in existence, were between 1850 and 1920. Okay. A general decline occurred in the number of Mary Lodge groups during the 20th century. One of the reasons normally given for its demise is the decrease of Welsh speakers. Oh. Preventing inhabitants from replying to the Mari group, as the Mary Lodge contest was almost always sung and performed in Welsh. Oh, that's too bad. Another okay. reason for the custom's decline was the increasing rowdiness and drunkenness, which became associated with it. This was seen as unacceptable behavior, especially with the rise of the chapel and Methodism in Wales. However, there has been a growing interest in the Mary Laud in recent years, and this has resulted in a resurgence in groups performing the tradition across Wales. Nice. Good. Bring it back. Yeah. Awesome. Like, I don't know if I would let a group of men come around a horse head in my house. Like, I don't know how comfortable I'd be. But I feel like if it was just a tradition, that'd be pretty cool to see. I think, like, I w it would be better if it was people that you knew. Yes. Yes. Like, I, w I don't think I... So, if I was the Mary Log, I don't know if I'd be... Hopping over to people I don't like strangers' houses. I don't know about that, but like you know, I'd fuck with my friends. <laughs> I think it'd be it. like some of these traditions are so cool and so much better than like the Santa Claus Day Parade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come on, mm -hmm. let's get the merry lot going. Yes. All right, your next story. Okay, so this is a fan submission. Yes. Okay. Going for it. So this is from Joey. Thank you, Joey, for sending in this story. Thank you, Joey. Okay, so it is titled, 
the Charles Cancel Hospital. Yes, going back to what episode? H. H? Oh, I don't know what number. Well, I don't know what number either. It's H. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so was it H or was it C? Hospital. I did a hospital? Yeah. Okay. I think so. That would make sense, right? Or was I lacking a C so I did Charles? I want to say H is for hospital. Yay! <laughs> H is for hospital. Yes. Okay. Okay. In my young adulthood, so this is written first person, his perspective. Perfect. Okay. In my young adulthood, I explored the Charles Cancel Hospital five times. In preparation, I had done extensive research on the building's history, any paranormal stories, and scouted the property to observe security patrols. <laughs> That is some effort. Yes. I mean, if you're going to do something, do it full assed. I Not half assed. <laughs> Fair. On my first visit to the hospital at around midnight on a fall evening, I took a group of friends with me, two of which were not believers in the paranormal. And I explained the possible paranormal encounters we could experience inside and outside of the building. Did did he actually make it inside the building? Oh, yes. That's fucking sick. Okay. Apparitions and shadows in the halls and rooms when inside and in the windows when looking on the outside. Other footsteps throughout the building, voices, cold spots, and that some had reported hearing a woman scream as if she's dying in pain while <laughs> approaching the building. <laughs> So we wait hidden for security to patrol by, then crawl through the field towards a group of grouping of trees. When we get to the trees, we look out to see where the patrols are so we can make our way to the exterior of the building unseen. But there was a specific window on the third floor that I kept being drawn to as if there was someone or something there staring at us. I point the window out to my group and a couple others said that they felt it too then sure enough as we're all looking at the window a black shadow appears blacker than the darkness of the room behind it and we all hear the most blood curdling scream i had ever heard absolutely not so loud it was if we could hear it in our heads get out get out bye <laughs> My friends, including the two non-believers, were terrified and wanted to nope the fuck out of there. Yeah, I would shit my fucking pants. <laughs> I wanted to press on, as we were already so close, but took the scream as a warning not to enter that night. I told my friends we would return. Of course you did. A couple nights later, we went back <laughs> to the capsule. Yes. Two of my friends, including a non-believer, said fuck that and stayed in my truck. Solid. We Solid life choices from those people. <laughs> Joey. <laughs> we snuck past security again and then reached the building without any screams this time. But, but every time, strongly felt like our approach to the building was being observed by something else. Love that. We quickly found a broken window that we could climb up, up to and get in from. Once inside, we explored. Many areas of the hospital were in a state as if people working there had just got up and left and never returned. Papers and mugs were still on the desk and sometimes strewn about. Filing cabinets, chairs, furniture still in what seemed to be their designated areas. Other areas were completely demoed, leaving just the skeleton of the building. Ooh. There was also large squares cut out of the concrete floor near the center of the hospital, allowing us to look up and down the other floors. <sighs> dangerous but cool, as we all had. Dangerous but cool, as we all had flashlights. In one of the stairwells, we found blood smeared along the railing, as if someone had a good cut on their hand intently smearing it along the rails cool, cool 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 we also found a very large patch of blood on a wall in one of the hospital rooms and felt very eerie in that room yuck 
the time after we convinced the rest of the group to join and showed them everything we had found the previous time. This time we explored the outside of the building first to find the best ways to get in, finding a bro ground level broken window easy to enter. The time after I took a completely different group made up mostly of scared ladies and was only able to slowly show them around a few areas as they kept screaming at every sound they heard. Solid. I then returned with the original group, and this time we explored every nook and cranny that we could find. But while proceeding to one of the lower levels, we heard very distinct footsteps. Not like the other times where it seemed ghostly, but heavy and loud. I told everyone to stop and turn off their lights. We waited at the bottom of the stairwell that entered into a very large demo area with poly tarping hanging all over the place. That would be the moment that you have to pee so fucking bad. <laughs> like you've never peed in your entire life. <laughs> or like just really thirsty and just dry mouth like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Joey's just raw dog in life over here. He sure the fuck is. <laughs> we continued to hear the footsteps, but they were getting louder and coming towards us. Then we saw flash flashes of light about 30 feet away. I pulled out my knife and asked who was there. We didn't get an answer, but kept hearing the footsteps and seeing the flashes of light. I asked again, who was there? And to come out and show yourself. I said, we are many and not looking for trouble. <laughs> Then the light got closer and closer, and behind a poly tarp emerged an indigenous man wearing a headlamp. Oh. We greeted each other and explained we were here to explore and asked what he was doing. He said he was looking for wires and metal to salvage and then asked if we explored the morgue yet. We excitedly said no, but we want to. He then led us there. Just raw dog in life. <laughs> oh my god. Like, <laughs> this strange man pops out from a poly tarp, and we're just like, cool, we're going to go to the morgue with you. <laughs> you would be in the truck. You'd be so jealous of the person that waited in the truck the time before. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, nope, no, no. This is how you get murdered. <laughs> it, no. Okay. <laughs> I, I wish I could raw dog life like Joey. <laughs> so the morgue had all of the stainless steel storage units and structures removed so that where the bodies would be were just huge square cement openings inside the morgue was a mist inside the morgue was a mist that swirled about and it felt extremely electric and heavy inside barf. absolute barf it was honestly exhilarating nope <laughs> After we were done in the morgue, the indigenous man and us parted ways, and he just walked off into the darkness, and we didn't hear or see him again. It was really strange how he just disappeared. <laughs> what if it was a ghost? What if it was just a ghost that just led them to the morgue? It was. We joked that he was a friendly spirit residing in the hospital that would guide people, but just chalked his disappearance off to being really good at what he does. Oh my no, God. that was a ghost. <laughs> I'm sorry, but if I was in an abandoned building stealing wire, I would not go up to the friendly group of teenagers. <laughs> I'd be like, Tito on your way. <laughs> oh my God, Joey. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Since we explored all the lower levels, we decided to see what was going on on the highest levels. Because <clears throat> why not? We. <laughs> why would there be any sense of self-preservation in this story? No. This is a Joey story. <laughs> we eventually explored the top floors and then found access to a maintenance top of floor. Of course you did. Because why? You'd be the group of girls screaming the entire time. I would be. I'd be like, <laughs> fuck no, guys. Mm -mm, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> We've seen our ghost. Have a nice day. <laughs> why are we tempting fate further? Okay. Once on that floor, the energy shifted very suddenly, and it felt extremely dark and ominous, as if there was a thousand beings watching us with malice, screaming at us to leave. No shit. 
It was a long, dark office-like hallway with rooms on each side and doors, walls, and ceilings hanging all over the place. So, I decided we should just press forward at least to the end of the hallway just to see what was up and then take off. Mm -hmm. We slowly made our way to the end of the hallway, all the while feeling like there was a large, massive darkness hovering over us, trying to feed off of our fear. At the end of the hallway was a door with an access hatch to the roof. We opened the door to a vertical circular cement access tunnel with a long steel ladder bolted to the wall inside leading up to the hatch in the ceiling. Must have been at least 20 feet high. So we started climbing up and about halfway, all of a sudden there was loud flapping of wings and screeching. There were birds inside and they were flapping all around us. That's a sign. We quickly climbed through and reached the opening of the roof. That sudden bird calamity scared the shit out of us, and once on the roof, we laughed our asses off. We decided this was the right spot to smoke a joint and busted out the bong one of us had in their bag. Oh my god. We smoked up on the roof and just chilled for a few minutes, taking in the night views. We watched the Edmonton police chopper fly around and noticed it was heading towards us. We laugh saying that we're just baked and it's not coming towards us until it was right overhead circling around. Oh my god. We all groaned about having to climb back down through the calamity of angry birds, but quickly did so anyways. We then made our way out of the hospital and back to my truck. The last time we went there, we went to our usual ground level opening, but upon entering, we were greeted by a large group of over 20 teenage boys. <laughs> Many of which which were carrying pipes, staffs, and bats. They they quickly surrounded us and asked if we had been there before. And I answered, yes, many times actually. We like to explore this place. Have you ever been? They answered no. And like I expected, they demanded we take them around. (laughs) I looked at my group to signal that I had a plan and they followed. I led the large group to the first few levels. And while showing them, they smashed their bats and pipes against anything that they were tempted to and it created the loudest reverberations literally could be mistaken for gunfire that's a great way to get caught right i led them through the stairwell to the third floor and held the door open beckoning them all to come through and start exploring the third level i stopped my group as they were in the rear and quickly told them to follow me we were going to ditch them and hide out on another floor The large group was easily distracted by the new level and were already smashing things, so we quickly escaped to the fourth floor and then went down to the opposite side that wasn't demoed yet and hid out in a room. Hmm. While hiding there for a few minutes, we could hear sirens getting louder and louder, so I peeked through the window and saw several police vehicles surrounding the perimeter of the property. We knew that they were called for the banging from the large group. Yep. Then all of a sudden, we could hear footsteps and voices coming down the hall from outside the room. It was the large group. I signaled my crew to get up against the wall and make no noise. As they walked past the room, we held our breath, hearing them say, Where the fuck did those guys go? And then calling for the rest of them to come on, the police are here. (laughs) We continued to wait in the room and saw the group run out of the hospital straight into the hands of the police. Perfect. I said, okay, the police got them, so we should just wait for them to leave and we'll exit. But the police chopper was there too, and it had shined his lights on the window of the room we were in. So we moved to the opposite side of the building and hid in a room there. (laughs) The chopper immediately followed us and shined its light through the window of that room, so we knew that they were using infrared to track us. We entered into a hall and were discussing what we should do when all of a sudden we heard the loudest echoing growling noise along with the f- along with fast boot steps. Sounded like a fucking monster. Oh, they have the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then a voice yelling that they're on this level. I said, quick, let's hide under something not knowing what else to do at the moment. <laughs> I heard the growling and bootsteps get louder as they were coming towards us with a voice saying that they're in this area. Then a, hey, I see you over there. Don't fucking move. (laughs) I looked behind me and see one of my friends decided to hide behind a window in a wall with the lights that the officer was shining his light through. (laughs) You're not coming on the next adventure, friend. No. You don't know how to hide. 
I then yelled for everyone to get up, and the police moved in around us. One of them said, you're, you're under arrest for being with the other group. You you came out as the dogs could smell you, and we were about to let them. Oh, you're lucky you came out as. You're fucking lucky you came out as these dogs could smell you, and we were about to let them loose to find you. <laughs> the dogs were growling and pulling on their leashes. The cops cuffed us with one hand behind our back, and we walked from the middle of the fourth floor down to pretty much outside pretty much in the dark as they were just shining their lights for themselves that part was scarier than any of the times before lol no kidding once outside we saw the whole perimeter surrounded with police officers and vehicles with the chopper over their head the police led us through towards a specific group of officers who greeted with us who greeted us with you guys are in a whole lot of shit yeah the officer in charge asked what we were doing there and said that they had the entire North Division responding to the calls of multiple shots mm -hmm. fired. And we were like, holy fuck. Mm -hmm. I explained to them that we were just here for the thrill of getting spooked exploring the abandoned hospital and it wasn't our first time doing so. I explained that this time we were met with a large group of male teens who were fairly hostile and enjoyed smashing their pipes and bats against anything they could. And it was so loud, and it could have been mistaken for gunfire. Yeah. I said we managed to escape from them by hiding out on the fourth floor where, when, where you get guys came and found us. The officer confirmed my story by saying that they got the group of guys and pretty much got the same story from them. He asked for our IDs. He came back a few minutes later saying that we won't be going home and we all have warrants out for our arrest now. Nice. <laughs> we looked at each other like, what the fuck? Then the officer laughed, saying, Just fucking with you. You're all free to go, but you're getting trespassing fines at state. If you're caught here again, you'll be arrested and charged. Perfect. We thanked the officers and quickly made quickly made our way back to my truck. We did not return until years later, when I brought Elise and a few others, but all the ways in have been welded shut. So thank you very much, Joey, for submitting that story. Yes, thank you. As a note, I would just like to say to our listeners that we do not encourage trespassing Absolutely without not. without permission. But and we do want to hear your stories if you have. Yes. <laughs> so also another note, Joey is very lucky because the Charles Townsville Hospital is like patrolled with like police dogs and guards with guns. So, like, the fact that it was the fifth time and they finally, like, got he, the dogs. He did his research. He watched the security. I know. He's still <laughs> very lucky. He is very lucky. Like, because we know people who were <laughs> yeah. ran down by the dog yeah. and then arrested. Yeah, we do. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Joey. That is a wonderful story. Yes, and don't forget, if you guys want to send in any of your listeners' stories, too, Please we'd love do. to read them. Uh, C4Creepy at gmail.com. It can be paranormal. It can be true crime. It can be both. But if it's true crime, please don't, like, incriminate yourself, ideally. Or or just don't include a name. Yeah. So, like, if you haven't been caught for this crime, don't give us all, like, the details Ideally, like, give us all the hot tea, but, like, don't give us your name. That'd be super great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, last, last nocturnal novella from you. We are doing festive superstitions. Yes. If you take a candle to church this Christmas, don't bring it home. Blow it out and leave it there with the vicar for good luck. Okay. Mistletoe is a magical plant. It keeps evil spirits away, as well as offering a good excuse to improve your love life. <laughs> Keep the Yule log blazing in your open fire. It is considered bad luck to light a fresh fire during the 12 days of Christmas. Is it? That's cool. Try to repay all debts and push the bank balance into black before the new year. Tradition states that ending a year in debt means a whole new year of debt. You're not wrong. If you burn a Yule log this Christmas, keep the ashes to bury along with your plant seeds. Oh. In the spring, 
superstition dis- dictates that you'll be assured a good crop. Nice. Don't buy a loved one new shoes for Christmas, or they'll pop them on and walk out of your life. Oh, what? That's a wild one. Sweep your house on Christmas Day to sweep all your bad luck away. Oh, I'm going to have to do that. Yeah. Very good. So there's the superstitions of the festive season. Awesome. Okay, so for my final story, I'm covering my favorite topic. Criminals who think that they can get away with smuggling but can't. Beautiful. A bag of drugs. Close. (laughs) From NBC News, this headline reads, Vitamin C in man's suitcase is cocaine. You'll get the joke. In May of 2009... A 76-year-old Dutch man claimed that the oranges he had in his suitcase were needed to keep his vitamin C up. (laughs) Custom officers in Rome arrested the unnamed man on international drug charges after discovering more than 13 pounds of cocaine had been packed into oranges that had been removed of their pulp. The man had arrived to the Leonardo da Vinci airport in Rome, traveling from Buenos Aires, Argentina, and was on his way back home to the Netherlands after enjoying a vacation. The drugs being smuggled had an estimated street value of over 5 million euro. Oh, shit. Yes. Grandpa's got gold. Oh, he's got some... I don't know. I was. I didn't have a better term for that. I I was trying to think of a good cocaine pun, but yeah, Noah, it's just not there. Jesus. But I I love that headline so much. The vitamin C is cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Well, thank you for those stories. Yes, thank you for yours and. We're going to have another nocturnal novella out next month. And then, following that, we will be starting season two. Yes, we will. And, like, before, I think we're going to do episodes on Tuesdays again. Yes. So, every Tuesday, starting in January. Yes, except for maybe not the second. No, probably not the second. Or the Probably not that one. No, the the second week of January. Yes. yes. After the holidays are over, after everybody's pulled themselves back together from the copious amounts of holiday drinking, um, we'll be back for season two. So please make sure that if you guys have any story recommendations, you email us at c4creepy at gmail.com. Or if you have any nocturnal novella stories, we would love to hear from you. Yes, we would. We love seeing the stories that come in. It's so wonderful. It so. is. It actually makes us like know that somebody's out there. <laughs> well, right. thanks for listening. Bye.